set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. For to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, but the mind set on the Spirit is, sorry, it's hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if in fact the spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the spirit is life because of righteousness. And if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. So this, this message is part of a series on the teachings of the Holy Spirit and the title of the message. Uh, the title of the message is Life in the Spirit. Um, I've, because the passage is the way it works, um, I'm, I'm going to exposit the passage and I'm going to share what God has taught me. There's going to be more than just stuff about the Holy Spirit. Uh, but, but I did want to acknowledge that this is part of a series on life in the, or, or a series on the Holy Spirit. A couple things I wanted to say just as we start getting, or get started. Some preachers have called Romans 8 the Mount Everest of the Bible, and I think there's, that's said for good reason. We've got a half an hour. We're going to just run through. You, you could spend months and months and months unpacking the, the, the truths in this chapter. It is absolutely amazing. Um, so, so hopefully this will whet your appetite for what, what's in the passage. Number two, if you've not read Martin Luther's preface to the book of Romans, go do so. It is fantastic. You can get it for free online. Uh, one of the things Luther emphasizes is the importance of the words that Paul is using, because he keeps using the same words over and over and over again. And he spends a bit of time unpacking that. We're going to do a little bit of that this evening, but Luther's preface to the book of Romans, very good. And the third thing is, is I owe a, a debt of gratitude to John Owen in his book, Spiritual Mindedness. Uh, it's a book about, yay thick, 150 pages or so. He spends all of his time unpacking verse 6 of Romans chapter 8. And that book was a big blessing to me as I read this. Uh, there'll be a few ideas from that book in the message. Uh, I just wanted to acknowledge that. Okay, so we're in Romans chapter 8. And if you saw it there, it says, there is now therefore... And so we've got a therefore, which means we have to find out why it's therefore, because there's a whole bunch of stuff before. So real quick, we're going to talk about the context. Paul is writing to the Romans. He hasn't been there before, but it's the capital of the Roman Empire. Very important letter. He wants to go there, and so he's kind of setting this as a message of, I'm going to tell you about the gospel before I come. And so we're at chapter 8. Chapters 1 to 7 lead up to chapter 8. So in chapters 1 and 2... Essentially, Paul speaks of our need for a savior. Chapters three through five, Paul spells out how Christ is that savior and the benefits of the salvation that Christ brings. Then in chapters six and seven, Paul talks about our responsibility to overcome sin. But then he concludes chapter seven with a problem. I'm going to read the last five verses of chapter seven, and I want you to know how many times Paul talks about himself, me, I, those words. Chapter 7, verse 21, Paul says, So I find it to be a law that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God in my inner being, but I see in my members another law waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. So he loves God's word, but there's something inside of him that hates that. And so he's got this conflict that's inside. And he says, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, I myself serve the law of God with my mind, but with my flesh I serve the law of sin. He's still acknowledging there's a conflict. And that conflict is what Paul begins with in Romans 8. And how do you deal with that conflict? We're left with this question. How do I overcome my sin? I think that's one of the questions that Paul is trying to answer in chapter 8 of Romans. There's other, question, other, other questions, but this is the one that to me was the one that spoke to me. So to understand Romans rightly, remember I talked earlier about words. One of the words we need to understand is what sin means. And as you read through the book of Romans, Paul, I think, has 
three different versions of sin in mind. So we're going to see also that the Holy Spirit plays a vital step in resolving each of those three forms of sin. So we're going to unpack that. We're going to use the passage for that. So there's three forms of sin in Romans. The first one's called legal guilt. The second is the deeds of the flesh. So there's a legal thing, there's the stuff we do, and then there's the third one, something called our sin nature. That's what he was getting at in Romans 7. Sin is there ready to commit sin. The law comes back, but the sin in me wants to fight against it. That's the sin nature. And when we let the sin nature rule us, that leads to deeds of the flesh. And those things are kind of independent of legal guilt. So we're going to unpack this. And uh, I can give you the slides, Dave, if you want, because we're going to get into this a little more later. But anyway, um, so the amazing thing about the gospel is it deals with every single one of these things separately, but as a complete package. It's amazing. So first thing it does, verses 1 to 4 of chapter 8, Christ by the Holy Spirit frees us from legal guilt. That's what when Paul says, there is therefore now no condemnation. Condemnation, that word is a legal term comes from a Greek word, katakrima. It's the idea of a decision against someone or a condemnatory judgment in the legal sense. But there's a couple ways of looking at it. So first off is, we hear there's no condemnation. The first one we should think of is, God does not condemn those in Christ. That's something that hopefully, the gravity of that will, will sink in for us because that is a very, very significant thing. And I don't have the time to go, there's so much to do. I, I would love to just dive into each of these things, but we got to move on. But that's, that's one truth. The second one, and this is an application, if God doesn't condemn us, we have no business condemning ourselves. And I don't know about you, but that's something I do frequently. I've messed up again, and I want to go down into that, the, the, the doom spiral of, of feeling self-condemned. And that's, that we have no business doing that because if God doesn't condemn us, we shouldn't condemn ourselves. The passage also uses the term in Christ Jesus. That's again, another very, very significant term. The phrase in Christ appears throughout the first chapter of the book of Ephesians. Paul has so much in mind when he says that. That word in though is the Greek word en, which means in. But it has the sense of being at rest or remaining in place. So there's a couple passages. I don't have the time to get into these, but our identity is in Christ. That's what it means when we says in Christ. Our identity is in Christ. Society talks a lot about gender identity and political identity, and I self-identify as this, that, and the other stuff. And whether you agree with that or not, I don't, but it doesn't matter because the Bible speaks to identity in a way that trumps any identity we can give to ourselves. God gives us identity in Christ. That's an eternal identity. That's an identity that connects us with God. And it is more important, more foundational, more fundamental than any identity we can give to ourselves. So if you think about this whole thing about identity, we think of ourselves as in Christ. That's our identity. And it totally trumps every other identity we can possibly have. Again, we can unpack that, but unfortunately we can't. The other idea is that our rest and comfort is in Christ. We can come to him because we are in him. And again, that idea of in is, it's the idea of being st a state, a state of rest. We can find our state of rest in Christ because we're not condemned. So the idea with all of this then is the law of spirit, how this works. The law of spirit frees us from the law of sin and death. We talked about the Holy Spirit. The spirit activates all of this freedom from legal guilt when we come to faith in Christ. How? It was this idea of justification which means that God sees us as righteous. How does this work? Well, God, in verse three, verse three is kind of a hard verse to read. But what, the gist of what Paul's getting at is that God condemned our sin in Christ's flesh. That's the idea. It's this idea called substitutionary atonement. Christ paid our penalty on, it, or, yeah, Christ paid for our penalty. He took it on our behalf. It's a substitution of atonement. Atonement is making things at one, at one bit. That, that's atonement. He is a substitute that atones for our sin. So the law of Christ is fulfilled, or the law is fulfilled on our behalf in Christ. That's something called imputed righteousness. I'm giving a lot of technical words here. If you, these are new, I encourage you to go look them up. Imputed righteousness is a righteousness that is put on us. God declares something. Remember, this is legal guilt, a legal declaration. Righteousness is put on us when we come to faith in Christ. 
who walk not in the flesh, but in the spirit. The idea here is not that is, is that the righteousness is not the root of a righteous, sorry, the, 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 the walking of the spirit is not the root, but it's fruit. We behave in a certain way because we are saved. And the Holy Spirit dwells in us. If you go further down to verse nine, that's a mark. It's the idea of the indwelling or making his home in us. And again, that's the first way the Holy Spirit works through us in the gospel and in salvation. So that's the first thing. The second thing, which we're gonna spend most of our time on is the Holy Spirit empowers us to fight the flesh. The problem is, is even if we are declared righteous, we still sin. So what do we do with that? But we're no longer slaves to sin. And this is the important part. The big difference between a person who's saved and a person who's not saved is not that the person who's saved doesn't sin. It's that the person who is saved is no longer a slave to sin. They have the ability to overcome and fight their sin. The Holy Spirit gives us the power to overcome sin. He dwells in us. But just because he dwells in us doesn't mean we automatically overcome. We have to let him fill us. We have to cooperate with him. And this is what I would call imparted righteousness. So in the justification part, the legal part, that's imputed, it's put upon us. This part is the behavior part. This is the part where we have a part to play in the existing reality of us being saved. And that righteousness is imparted to us. It's, it's handed out to us, but we have a responsibility to take at it and say, okay, I'm gonna apply this to my life. The potential's there, but it's up to us to, 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 to draw the Holy Spirit's power to overcome our sins. And this is the second word. So we talked about justification. This is now sanctification, the ongoing process of becoming more and more like Christ. It's a necessary fruit of justification. If you're not growing in your, in your behavior righteousness, that's maybe a question of, am I really in Christ? But if you do see, even if it's a microcosm of growth, you just want to be more holy even, that's a good sign. All right, so here's a summary of um, the idea of the flesh versus the spirit. Paul in verses four to nine, he keeps talking about this idea of the flesh is this and the spirit is this. So the flesh, the word there is sarx, that's a Greek word. Spirit is pneuma. That should sound, be more familiar. Flesh literally means uh, it's the body something physical. That's the basic meaning of Sarx. But again, as with Paul, the meaning of the word usually goes deeper. So we'll talk about the deeper meanings in a second. The spirit is breath. You're going to see the contrast here. What is physical, tangible, what is intangible. The body, by Paul's definition, is self-focused. The flesh looks out for itself. The spirit, on the other hand, is Christ-focused. It's more interested in the things of Christ than it is in the things of self. The flesh is worldly. The spirit is heavenly. The, sp the flesh loves what is sinful. This is a key. The spirit loves what is holy. At its deepest root, the flesh cares nothing for what is holy. It only cares for what is sinful. The end of the flesh is enmity against God and death. And the spirit is life and peace. That's verse 8, 6. Or chapter 8, verse 6. So there's this, this war that's going on inside of us. Paul says, okay, well, what is the fruit of this? Well, he talks about the words walk and live in verses four and five. And he's going to go deeper as we, as we go. He's, he uses verbs to describe the person of the flesh versus the person of the spirit. He starts off with these words, walk and live. And again, that means how we live, but deeper. He talks about our actions, our lifestyle, our habits. Then he talks about the idea of setting our minds or being minded. So again, we start off with actions. Now we're talking about thoughts. He's working his way deeper. And then again, is how we think, but deeper. When Paul says your, your mind is set, it's not just thinking, it's, it's set. It means your, your mind is in this position on a regular basis. It's our worldview. It's our preoccupations, the things that normally come to mind. They're what we naturally think about. And finally, he uses the words in the spirit or in the flesh or have the spirit. And this is more of a position or a possession. But again, deeper. What is our comfort? What is our identity? What is our home? Is it the flesh or is it the spirit? And again, there's a conflict for us, but if you're a believer in Christ, 
you're going to see a progression more towards the things of the Spirit because you know the things of the flesh are temporary. And the things of the Spirit are far more beautiful and they're far more powerful and they're eternal. So, as we look at this passage, guys, I found this passage to be just terrifying as I went through it. Because I'm looking at this evidence and then I look at myself and ask the question, am I fleshly or spiritual? And there's a conflict. And that's a humbling thing. So to help us identify, am, am I one or the other? Some questions to think about. And I hope you think about this afterwards. What is your first love? What do you want the most? Do you want the thing that is drawing you to sin? Or do you want the things of God in Christ? That helps you understand, are you primarily this or that? What do you want the most? What are you naturally preoccupied with when you're just kind of off, maybe when you go to the bathroom or you go out for a walk and your mind is given the chances to start thinking about it, what it naturally thinks about. What do you find yourself thinking at that point? Are you stewing about something you're upset at? Are you thinking about this thing you don't have but you really, really want? Or are you thinking about God and the things he's doing in your life? Or are you just like me, just calling out to God for mercy? Because you know you're not the person that you want him to be, but you want to draw God and you just want him. Despite outward virtues, ultimately a fleshly person will be driven by lust or wealth or pride or anger or something. When the push comes to shove, a person who is fleshly, that's the thing that's going to drive them. It's themselves. And despite perceived vices, a spirit-filled person will ultimately be driven by an attraction, attraction to Christ. That's one of the ways of knowing what drives you at your most fundamental level. If the spirit's there, there's going to be an attraction to Christ. It may not be perfect. It may not be consistent, but it's there. And as you go through your life, it's going to become more and more and more. So, application. How do I fight the flesh? We've talked about the contrast. And as my dad so often says, he likes to talk about what, why, and how. We've done some of the why, we've done some of the what. I want to spend a couple minutes talking about the how. How do I fight the flesh? So, quiz time. You older people, hopefully, if you have any connection with the United States, should remember this. Just say no. Does anyone know the rest of the sentence? Okay, we've got a lot of good Canadians here. I, I'm, a, I'm a dual citizen. I grew up in a border city. This was on TV all the time. Just say no to... Drugs. It was a campaign. This is Nancy Reagan, 1987. She was launching a campaign, and the campaign went on TV, radio, all through the 1990s. It was, the message was plastered everywhere, just say no to drugs. Question, did it work? No. It was a terrific failure. Why? Why did it not work? Why, why do you think the, the, the campaign, just say no to drugs, wouldn't work? Any ideas? I know this is supposed to be more of a sermon format, but if anyone has any ideas. Okay. You're right on it. Exactly. There's no replacement. You can't say no to something effectively unless you're saying something, saying yes to something that's better. Otherwise, you're focusing on the thing you're saying no to. Guess what? Don't think about pink elephants. What are you thinking about? Pink elephants, right? Just say no to drugs. What am I thinking about? Drugs. That doesn't work. But that's not Paul's tactic. Paul thinks about this. His focus is Christ. And if you love Christ, you're going to hate sin. It will eventually come out because Christ is beautiful. And when Christ is beautiful, sin is ugly. And you're going to hate it for the sake of hating sin. You're not going to learn to trade one sin for another. Today I'm going to fight my anger. Tomorrow I'm going to fight my lust. But I'm going to love my anger tomorrow. Today I love my... It, 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 people play that. You know, the game of whack-a-mole. When you learn how beautiful Christ is, it doesn't matter what the sin is. You're going to hate it. You're going to hate all sin for the sake of sin. And you're going to hate it in yourself, but that's okay because Christ is in you too. But if you find yourself loving sin, it means you're going to hate Christ we can't serve two masters. So learn to love Christ. That's how you fight the flesh. Okay, so how? Let's go a little deeper. How do I fight my sin? Well, the first thing is, remember that Christ came explicitly for sinners. He says in Matthew, I didn't come to, come for, to, for, to save the righteous. I came to save sinners. The healthy don't need the doctor. The sick do. 
So he came for people like us. That should be encouraging. We don't have to have our act together to come to him. In fact, he, he won't even let us come to him unless we come broken as we are. Let, let us bring our baggage, which is the second. Bring our baggage to Christ. He says, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden. If you've got a heavy load, whether it's a worry, a sin, a difficult circumstance. He doesn't describe what the baggage is. He just says, bring it. I'm gentle. I'm lowly in heart. You'll find rest in me. So come and bring everything. Be real. It's okay. I came to save you. I know what's wrong. Just come. Fill your mind regularly with holy thoughts. That's how to fight your sin. Think about the attributes of God. Who is this God that has sent this Savior for us? The sinfulness of our sin. That's actually a holy thought to think about just how devious sin is. It does a good job sometimes of pretending to be righteousness. Well, I'll confess this sin, but I got this one underneath. I'm not going to confess that one. We know all about that. That happens a lot. All of that's sinful. And that's okay. Christ wants to dig through all of that so that we can be healed. And think about the love of Christ in spite of our sin. It's throughout the scriptures. And remember that sanctification is a process. God knows that none of us has arrived. Remember talks about in, in chapter seven, wretched man that I am, who will save me? Well, thanks be to God in Christ. He knows our sin way better than we know our own. And yet he still sent Christ. The Geneva Bible says something really interesting in this verse. It says, the spirit of regeneration abolishes sin in our flesh, not all at once, but by degrees. Thus, we must in the meantime call to God through patience. He doesn't save us or sanctify us all at once. It's a process. He knows it's a process. Let's remember ourselves it's a process. And above all, remember that Christ is both the source and the object of our love. We love because Christ first loved us. We can't love unless we understand his love for us. He who is forgiven little, little loves little. So let's understand how much he, we are forgiven. That helps us to be patient with other people. God wants us to want him. A holy obsession with Christ is our surest way of overcoming sin. So Paul offers us some helpful thoughts from the rest of Romans. And I'm running like 10 minutes behind. Oh my goodness. Okay, I may have to skip a couple things. So if you go through the rest of Romans, you'll see a few things. Our identity as a child and heir of God. That's a helpful thought. The hope of future glory. That's a helpful thought to help us fight our sin. We have the first fruits of the spirit. I think that means the ability to resist sin. You're not alone. The Holy Spirit intercedes for us. And God is making us more like Christ, step by step. We're not alone in this battle against sin. He's with us. Will we rely on him? And also the end of verse, verse chapter eight, if you've read the last bit of chapter eight, it's fantastic. Paul climaxes into this idea that the love of God in Christ for his children is overwhelming and invincible. An amazing rest of the chapter. So if you get the chance, go and read the rest of the chapter. There's so much stuff to just park and think about that helps us to overcome our sin because the love of God is for us so much. Remember, it says verse, chapter eight, verse 34, who's to condemn? Well, hold on, verse, eight, verse one already answered that. There is no condemnation. So who is to condemn? It's nobody. And nothing can separate us from his love. All right, I think this is important. I'm gonna tell, I, I am gonna go over a little bit. This is, I think, really important piece, especially because my family is watching and I need to confess this to them. And I think this is probably gonna be helpful to you. So this is kind of a, where the rubber hits the road. So um, I have, if you guys don't know me very well, I have a, uh, where am I here in my notes? I didn't say any of this. Okay, so I, I have a very active, oh yeah, here it is. I have an intense ex expressive personality. You see this on the piano sometimes? They get really going at the piano. That's when I'm in my good state. When I'm in my bad state, I do the other thing. I, I, I go that way too. So I'm an intense and a rather expressive personality. And I have a lifestyle that is, at this point in life, chaotic and a bit frayed due to some of it is circumstances within my own control, but some of it not. So I'm self-employed, we homeschool our kids. My wife has a torn ACL and 
life is just kind of crazy, just in general. But we've, we've got extra things going on that were kind of beyond our circumstances. So life is a bit frayed right now. There's a lot of things that I'd like to get to. I like to have things under control. I like things to be in order. Things are never in order. So as a result, I, I have a choice to make. And too often I make the wrong choice. And I need to learn to make the right choice. So we're going to apply what we just talked about to me in the hopes that this will kind of work for you. So the natural result for me is, is I go into bear mode. When I'm overwhelmed and I'm in the middle of working on something and Jonas comes and says, dude, I, I, I got to go potty. I need your help. Well, I've got like six other things going on. That could be the thing that causes me to blow. Or Elizabeth, she's, she's on crutches. She needs me to move something from point A to point B. Again, I got 30 things already on my mind. This is the extra thing. And sometimes I just blah, go into bear mode. That, that's the natural flesh thing to do. But it's a self-focus, now is all that matters mentality. That's really the root of it, is I am being self-centered. God has allowed me to be in the situation that I'm in. I just fail to see that. I think I have to deal with all these things on my own. And so I get overwhelmed. I get frustrated. Martin Luther said, the carnally minded person feels that he is himself the final and ultimate object in life. He considers good only those things that are good to him. That's me. Just up in front confessing, that's me when I'm in the flesh. But when I take a moment to interrupt my, oh, sorry, and then, then this, this can lead to a doom spiral because I get angry and then I get angry at myself because I'm angry. And that leads to despair. And a deeper part of despair makes it easy for me to get angry again later, which then puts me into deeper despair and it just goes into a spiral and I just become more and more and more and more, and more angry and upset. So I need to interrupt that. So how do I interrupt that? Well, there's an alternative, and that's to be open to what the Holy Spirit has for me. First off, I should be thankful to the Spirit for revealing my self-centeredness. That's a good thing. And so my wife often will say, dude, you're being angry. And sometimes I don't react well in the moment, but if I'm smart, I think about it, and I realize, yes, you are correct. And that's the Holy Spirit prompting me that, hey, you're trying to do it all yourself. You're being way too self-centered. And if I acknowledge that, that's the, that's, that's the beginning of the path out. I need to work daily and sometimes hourly and sometimes moment by moment to refocus myself on Christ's love for me and the priority of the gospel. Does having everything in order matter? No. Remembering that I'm in Christ is the thing that matters. The problem is that's intangible and I, I forget it, which is why I have to deliberately remind myself of this all the time. But I'm bullheaded and that's just the way it's got to go sometimes. And learn to rely on him moment by moment for help and peace. I will say this from experience, as long as I get that first part right, God really helps with the rest of it. Because I've opened the door to the Holy Spirit working, and once that happens, he tends just to swoop in and just, it, 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 the rest of it kind of starts happening a lot better. But I just need to open myself to, okay, God, I, I'm done, I need you. And, and the Spirit begins working at that point. So hopefully that's, that's helpful to you. Um, I will say the last, I, I think we all suffer from spiritual attention deficit disorder. Yeah. <laughs> so that, that's not just you, that, that's all of us, I think. And so I'm going to plug the, 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 the men's retreat because we're going to unpack this whole idea. I've been asked to lead a topic on personal worship at the men's retreat. So if you like what this is and you say, okay, James, I need more how, we're going to discuss as guys more how at the men's retreat Please come if you haven't registered. You do not see in the bottom corner there, please register before October 20th. We all tend to wait until the last minute, so please register. There are still spaces. Last year was my first year there. It was fantastic. I want to go. If I'm physically able to go, I'm going to go. It's just great, so please come. Not just for me. It's going to be a great time. Okay, last thing. The Holy Spirit kills our sin nature and raises us to eternal life with Christ. So we talked about justific justification. The Spirit indwells us. We've talked about sanctification. The Spirit fills us. Now we're talking about glorification. The Spirit who resurrected Jesus will give life to our mortal bodies. This is the future part. It's obviously not now. It's future. This is glorification. The purging of the sin nature. This happens at death or at resurrection. Or when Christ comes. It's not now, but it's going to happen. It's going to come. And at this point, we have what's called infused righteousness. Just like tea is infused, you, you fill the whole drink, and the entire drink is now filled, 
permanently. You can't even separate it out. The tea is in the, in the water. It's infused. That's what the Holy Spirit's going to do. Well, that, that's what the type of righteousness we're going to have at that point. It's not just, it's not just um, I'll get to it in a sec. I, I forgot, but we'll get to it in a sec. I got a summary. And the Spirit transforms us into the image of Christ. We will see the Lord face to face and forever be with Christ, freed from all sin. So a summary. Legal guilt is the first form of sin. Second form of sin is deeds of sin. The third form of sin is the sin nature. Okay, this is a summary of everything because I threw a lot of theological words at you. So here's the summary, the whole picture. Each of these is dealt robustly by the gospel. In our legal guilt, we are justified. There is no more legal guilt because we are legally declared righteous. Even if the rest of it isn't there yet, the legal definition is we are righteous. The deeds of sin, the Holy Spirit empowers us to fight sin now. That's sanctification, the process of being made holy. And in, in the future, our sin nature will be done away with by glorification, where all of it is purged and we are made to be like Christ. The righteousness of the, that deals with the legal guilt and justification is imputed, it's put upon us. The deeds of sin or sanctification are dealt with by imparted righteousness. It's given to us, but it's up to us to activate it. And in glorification, righteousness is infused into us. It's cool you get all those I words together. All right, and again, the Holy Spirit dwells in us when we become saved. He fills us throughout this Christian life. And in the future, he will transform us. That's amazing. The gospel deals with all of this sin so robustly, so thoroughly. It is amazing. And we've taken a little over half an hour to unpack this. There is so much more. But I hope this is whet your appetite for just how deep the gospel is, how much we need the Holy Spirit. I was gonna give a warning. I'll have to tell the story later. I got this from a friend of mine. It has to do with uh, William Wilberforce and William Pitt. But I don't have the time to read it. Uh, it, is, it is a very interesting one. Brian says read it. He says read it. Okay, I'm gonna read it. I have permission. Brian says it's okay. This, he told me not to say this, but this is his illustration. So this is courtesy of Brian. All right. So I read this and I, I just love this because I think this speaks to any, any time the word of God encounters us, I think this is a warning for us to remember, not just for this message. Martin Lloyd-Jones once gave an illustration concerning two great men, William Wilberforce on the left, who was responsible for the abolition of slavery in England back in the mid 1800s or so, believer, amazing guy. And William Pitt the Younger, who's the guy on the right, who was the one-time prime minister of Britain. So they're both British politicians. They're both brilliant men and also great friends. William Wilberforce was converted and became a Christian while William Pitt, like so many others, was but a formal Christian, is what Lloyd-Jones says. So the story has it that Wilberforce invited Pitt to come and listen to a preacher named Richard Cecil. Cecil was a great evangelical preacher and Wilberforce delighted in his ministry. Pitt finally accepted to come and listen to Cecil preach. Cecil was at his best, preaching in his most spiritual and elevated and exalted manner. Wilberforce was delighted and could not imagine anything better, anything more enjoyable, anything more wonderful. And he was wondering what was happening to his friend, William Pitt, the prime minister. Well, he'd soon find out. Once outside the building, Pitt turned to Wilberforce and said, you know, Wilberforce, I have not the slightest idea what that man was talking about. This passage terrified me as I read it, because I know after thinking about it and studying it and reading multiple books on it over the last two months, it's, it's not just in my mind, I'm only beginning to understand what Paul is saying, but also in my heart, there is still so much more work to do. But being aware of that, I think is a good thing. But I do pray that as you listen to this and any time you interact with the scriptures, I really, really hope that your response is not that of William Pitt, that I have no idea what they're talking about. Because if that's the case, there's something seriously wrong with your soul. And that is a scary thing. And if that is your situation, I encourage you to cry out to God for help, that the Holy Spirit would 
teach you and open your heart. I know a couple people that spent a lot of time in church, a lot of time in the Bible, and the fruit in their lives makes me wonder where they're at spiritually. And that's scary. And I know if they hear this message, probably both of them will know who I'm talking about. And I hope they're not offended by what I say. I don't mean to hurt them. I'm just legitimately scared for their souls. Because the consequences of what Paul's writing here are so significant that if you just read it over and just go, okay, yeah, this thing about flesh, spirit, whatever. But the consequences, the impact is so profound. I want them to have what Paul's trying to give us. I want all of us to have it. I can barely grasp it myself. But I think barely grasping it is enough for God because he can give us the rest. So that's the warning. Last slide. Paul sums up the whole thing. It is a good summary. He's a great preacher. Verses 12 and 13. We're going to wrap it up with this, and then we'll go to prayer. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors, not to the flesh to live according to the flesh. We owe the flesh nothing, is what Paul's saying. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit, can't do it by ourselves, by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. Let's pray. Father, your word is so profound. And our hearts are so full of sin that the light of your word is terrifying. But we need it. Help us to hunger for your word, even despite our failures. Help us to realize that it is for dark hearts that you give us the light of the scriptures. It is not there to help us justify ourselves. It is there to lay our souls bare before you so that we would see the error of our ways and cling to you instead of to our sin.